You're watching a video from the Alley Church, located in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. First off, I want to welcome you. If this is your first time at the Alley, we are so glad that you came to celebrate and worship with Jesus with us this Sunday. Second off, I want to tell you that David Black makes the best coffee that you've ever tasted, and I'm sure there's plenty to be drank downstairs. Come on. So there's lemonade and coffee downstairs afterwards, so you don't got to rush home for a cool drink, all right? So first off, before, like, uh, like Greg said, we're part of the alley. We're part of this family, and we just said, uh, and when we were part of the family, me and my family, we love to celebrate. Like, I think that's the first thing Keegan learned from us was to celebrate. He's like, yeah, like everything. We're like, no, Keegan, everything. Like, you do something bad. He's like, yeah. I'm like, man, we really taught this kid how to celebrate. <laughs> but as the alley, we would love to celebrate together some great things. One as, you know, we've been going through this journey with Pastor Ben on discipleship. And I think one of the greatest things you get to see when you're in discipleship is people baptized. Can you agree with me on that? So we're going to be baptizing six people in a couple of weeks. Can we celebrate that? I mean, I don't know about y'all's family. We celebrate where we love for people to get baptized. Uh, Melanie's dad is a pastor, if you didn't know that. And so when we were there in California a couple of weeks ago, our niece came up and said, hey, I want to be baptized. And we were just so excited that she even had that thought. At how old is she? Nine years old? And say, I'm ready to commit my life to Jesus and be baptized. And we just love that. You know, everybody does baptism different, but when a child wants it and desires it, I think that is such a great thing, no matter how old they are. And so today I get the privilege of just speaking with you about a topic that is so dear to my heart. Uh, I think when Pastor Ben gave me this passage, he really didn't understand what he was doing. Because this is the kind of passage that me and Melly have, have like, lived out, went through, came back to so, for so many years. Like, I remember the first time I heard the poor and powerless. I was in Bible college. And as soon as I met Melanie and we were, we were looking at each other, and I said, hey, have you heard this song, The Poor and the Powerless? She says, no, I've never heard this song. I said, man, I love this song. Like, even when we started our church, that was our inaugural song. <laughs> we love the song, The Poor and the Powerless, because it just does something to me. It does something to me when I think about how there's poor out there, and God has called us to do it. I love it because once I was poor and powerless, and like, I'm going to just tell you a little bit, not many of you have known my story, you know some of our moving stories, but you don't know, many don't know my personal story, how, when, how I started drinking at 13 years old. How at 17, I was kicked out my mom's house. How at 17, also, I was incarcerated in jail. How at 21, I've been to jail six times. At 22, I was facing a felony of a gun charge. And at 24, I was homeless on the street already for five years. And this is, this is, I was poor and powerless to what God wanted to do. And then by 29, I, I said, Jesus, I'm going to profess who you are in my life. And my life changed forever. I was an alcoholic, a drug dealer, all those, all those things that the poor and powerless are. And you know what was, what was really strange? Is that when I learned that, that Jesus wanted me and Jesus loved me, it changed my whole life. But somebody came to me. I remember this. I moved to Orlando, Florida to be, become a chef. And you know what? I, was, I, I tell people that if you move to Orlando in August... That's the dumbest thing you could ever do. <laughs> Move in January. It was so hot. And I remember I was in my, I was in my worst. And I'm walking along to the store to do, my, do the worst thing, buy a beer. And then next thing I know, this girl like, pulls up in front of me and like, corners me off. And she was like, that's my church right there. You should go there on Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> you know? I said, well, I'll see. <laughs> and so, and then a couple of more interesting things happened in my life where people came to me that brought me into the church. And then when I got into the church, I got to see something different. 
from what God. So first of all, I want to say I'm just so thankful to be privileged to share this message with you guys today. As I say, it encompasses not only our ministry, but our life when we start to talk about this. Uh, I want to note that when you talk about this parable, it's not like an apostolic story. This is a Jesus story. Jesus' stories far outweigh an apostolic story because of two things. One, command and prophetic vision. See, Jesus, everybody knows who was not in the church, they feel Jesus was a prophet. They know that what he says is coming true. But they feel that he was just a normal man. As church, as believers, we know that not only do we listen to Jesus because he has prophetic words, but because his words are commands for our life. And so this passage is actually a command and a, and a prophetic vision for the church that m- not many people say. And so basically, if you got pen and paper right now, you got one of the beautiful bulletins back there that got four huge points on it, this is my bottom line. This is like, don't you like it when pastors just tell you what everything's about? <laughs> this is the bottom line. This is the bottom line. If you're writing this down, put it in your phone. And if you have a uh, version, it's on that too. The preaching of the good news is for the poor. And I'm going to lay this out today in four points. And I know a lot of people, man, I get a lot of slack from that. <laughs> when I say to people, the preaching of the good news is for the poor. Because I'm going to tell you, these four reasons make it possible. If you're, if you're taking notes, one of these things is the house is not full. Until the poor are there. Uh, ordinary men always become preoccupied. Don't go through the points yet. I'm just, I'm just laying out some introduction. Uh, compassion fills the house. And compelling the poor is part of the kingdom. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the Alley family. I thank you for their hearts to serve and reach those that are far outside their means, God. God, I thank you that today, God, we get to talk about not only like a command, but we get to talk about a heart posture that we're going to go through. It's not just about what our hands and feet can do. It's about where our heart can be filled with, God. So, God, we ask you that your, your word fills every crevice of our heart, God, for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the tension I believe God wants us to hear today is that we need to witness in places where poor are, to preach the good news. Listen, we can't go to our country club, play golf, and try to preach good news to our best friend who sits next to us in church. We got to go to the places. Trust me, I tried it. It doesn't work. I tried to preach good news to my dad on a golf course. It didn't work. You got to preach good news to the places where there are. And I'm going to share some stories of, like, how that worked for me. Like, going to places and preaching good news, and it worked. How many of us like something that works? <laughs> and it worked for me. See, and the church needs to do another thing. Create a space. Create a space for the poor so that we can walk with them, not just in this moment of ministry, but in their everyday life. Yeah. See, that makes a huge difference. We can all make a sandwich and get, don't, don't, I'm not mad about making sandwiches, I'm going to just put that out there. But we all can do that. But do all of us go to tent cities and hand them the sandwich and be in their environment? That's the difference when you're walking with the poor. It's scary. It's not in a place that you want to be in. It's uncomfortable. Like Pastor Ben said in Psalms 91, these are places that we have to walk in the shadow of the Almighty. These are very dangerous places. So we have to do those things. I grew up in the South, and so let me tell you, Baptists have a very different way of seating seating in church. So they don't have the same way of seating in church as you guys do in the alley, which I appreciate. (laughs) I would just let you know that right now. I remember the first time I sat in somebody's family's pew that had a plaque on it that was memorialized. And I sat there, and I was a newcomer, and the old lady came up to me and said, you're sitting in my seat, sir. Can you please move? I said, oh. I said, all right, now we need to make room <laughs> for the poor. So that's kind of the kind of sentiment that sometimes that, that people, we want the church to have room. So, Ali, if we asked everybody to move up front and sit in the front so we have room for people who are new, who've never heard the gospel before, 
That's, that's a powerful thing to do. Say, hey, I'm going to give up my normal seat that so somebody can sit here that's never sat here before. And so that's kind of the sentiment I want to put out to us today. And then I say all around the world, people, people who, who want to reach the poor and the poor are getting a bad rap. I, I, I lived in a city named St. Louis, and I tell people all the time, it taught me how to pray. Because I came from a place where evangelism and reaching the poor was very simple. But the city put a lot of laws and ordinances around it, so I couldn't do that. Like, I was hanging out with churches that fed people in public, and all of a sudden, we get the cops coming up to us talking about we're going to jail. <laughs> because we're breaking the law. And I also tell people, we need a little bit of civil disobedience sometimes when we're sharing the gospel. Will we take those type of risks to feed the poor? And that's it. In the city, they just did. They shut down the number one homeless shelter in the middle of the city. They just closed it down and boarded it up. What do we do about things like that? How does the church react when somebody does something like that? I even found in my own neighborhood, Dayton's Bluff, there's not a great opportunity for us to reach the poor because there's, there's some animosity there. We want to keep our neighborhood sacred, but we don't want the poor to be around us. I kind of get the sentiment sometimes, if we don't see it, it's not there. In America, that's kind of how we live. You know, if once we start seeing it, then we got a problem. <laughs> and so we don't want that to happen in the church. We want to have a different heart posture. We want to say, when we see it, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity for those to be preached to by the gospel. And so that's what I want to say today. And uh, my assignment today is very clear. Pastor Ben said, preach on filling it up. I don't know if y'all know what that means, but fill it up. <laughs> We're going to run over. So let's go through the word. We're going to Luke 14, 21 through 23. Thank you guys for being with me today. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the at least, yes, of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And after the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. My goodness. How does that feel? There's still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lane and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house must be full, or will be full, or can be full, or needs to be full. Point one, the house is not full until the poor are there. And so I know in your head right now, you got this image of who is poor. <laughs> you got this image of somebody that's poor. Maybe I can describe it. He's Randy. He's got white, long, stringy hair with the glasses. He's got a mental illness. He's very tall, six feet. He stands out. That's who I'm talking about for today, but that's not who Jesus was talking about in this passage. You know who the poor were when Jesus was talking about this? He was talking about this table. And like, as we celebrate communion, Jesus is talking about this table. Pastor Ben said this table goes from far as east as far as west. It's infinite. It's infinite on both ends about this table. And Jesus is talking about the prophetic acceptance of Gentile people. He's saying prophetically, this house is going to be filled with those who are poor. Who are the poor? Those who reach the end of their rope, who are hopeless, who have nowhere to turn, whose gods are dead, have no worship in their hearts. Those people are poor. Have nobody to pray to and see things happen. Those people are poor. Those people are poor who have no hope. If you ever see somebody that is hopeless, you can associate them with the biblical meaning of poor. If you ever see somebody who's reached the end of the rope, because I've reached it, we used to call it, in, in one of my ministries called reaching the end of yourself. Have you ever met anybody that reached the end of their self? That's a poor person. That's a poor person. Have you ever seen, if somebody's homeless, you know they have nothing else to give. They're just there to receive. So Jesus talked earlier about how we should invite these people because there's nothing that we can get back. And he said, your reward for giving to the poor is this, that you will have a seat at the table in heaven 
and be celebrated as a saint of God. If that alone is not enough initiative for you to reach somebody that's poor, I don't know much more I need to do for you today. <laughs> that is one of the most amazing things, to be written in the land books of life and know that you have a seat at the table with Jesus. Oh my goodness. I've been at many tables, and that seat is not as good as the seat with Jesus. I, I'm just telling you for a moment just to think about sitting at the table with Jesus and everything that you've done is a celebration of that. Everything you've done to reach people, everything you've done to speak the gospel, everything you've done to spend all your money, everything you've done to be in the darkest places has been a celebration to Jesus. It's not something that's a work or a, a laborious to Jesus. He says, I'm going to celebrate him when he gets to my table. And so when we do communion, it's two things. It's one to examine our hearts, but it's also to do a celebration. To say, Jesus, we're going to be sitting at the table with you as I eat this bread and drink this wine. Now, if you're not doing the things that Jesus commanded you to, sometimes it feels hard. I'm going to just be real. I had to examine my own heart a couple of months ago. And say, Jesus, I'm not doing everything you called me to do. And I can't take communion unless, unless I examine my heart. And I need to examine the things in my heart so that when I come to your table, I can celebrate fully. And so that's a personal conviction that we all must make. But Jesus is saying, when you come to my table, it's a celebration. Come on, everybody celebrate. All right. So uh, we need to ask ourselves this question. If you're taking notes, hopefully some people are. How did Jesus walk with the poor in his day? So as Jesus is telling this story, there's two people. I like to use this word. My wife said, uh, maybe don't use that word. But there's two different meanings. Servant, slave. In the King James Version where I grew up in, in that Baptist church, everything was slave. There was no such thing as servant in the Bible. So it says servant, slave. And then there's this master. How many of us seen a Disney movie? All right. I should see more hands than that. <laughs> All of you have seen a Disney movie. What happens in the Disney movie when the king has a dinner? Everybody comes. Does anybody get a chance to deny him? No, but in this parable, it happened. Can you believe that? The, the king, the master, who is Jesus, is having an interchange with us, and he's saying this right there. He says, hold the phone. You just told me I invited ordinary men to come sit at my table, and they refused me? They refused to come to me? He's furious. He's mad. How many of us say it's okay? God has the right to be mad. He has the right to be furious if he tells us to do something and we don't do it. And then he says, the king says, this is like a reaction I've never seen God have. We've never seen God have. We've been taught that God loves us so much, but God has a reaction when we don't do the things he called us to do. And this is what the, Jesus is showing. He's saying, since you didn't invite them, I'm angry. Since you didn't want to come, I'm angry. In the, uh, before in the parable, God said, oh, I just got married. I ain't coming to your dinner. Another guy said, oh, I just bought a donkey. I'm not coming to your dinner. Another guy said, oh, I just bought a house. Forget your free food. I mean, come on, think about those things. I don't care. Like sometimes me and Melanie, we go, if somebody invites us to dinner, we're going. It has to be extraneous circumstances for me not to go. Like four flat tires for me not to go because I'm going. But everyone the servant went to was busy. Let's go on to point two. Men are always preoccupied. Isn't that the truth? See, the truth of this is not that, that we're better than any other people in time. Is that we're facing a fact right now that everyone is always busy. And even in this season of our world, everyone's too busy for the things of God. Like, I keep telling you I grew up down south. If you live down south for any short period of time, church is drastically different. Sundays are drastically different. I went to church three times on Sunday. I went to Bible study at 9 o'clock. 
service at 11 o'clock. We had fellowship dinner till 3, and then we came back for service at 6. And we didn't get home till 8 and 9. Wasn't nobody worried about homework, baseball games, football games. None of that happened. I mean, I was, I was floored when I saw that my nephew had to go on Sunday. I was like, what the heck is going on? The religious Carl jumped out and started speaking in tongues and all kinds of stuff. I was like, man, so religious. I'm like, all right, God. You allowing this to happen? All right, we're going to do this. But we get busy. I mean, even young adults now, they rather go to brunch than church. Yeah. Brunch is on Sunday. So this master, the master gets so angry in this moment because people are preoccupied. Like, when I looked up what this anger was, it was not like an anger that was kindled with just like, man, I'm so mad at you. It was the anger where I'm filled, he was filled, like in Revelation, it tied to the dragon in Revelation. Yeah. That kind of anger. I don't know, when the dragon fell because Jesus won, he was mad because he lost. God has the, the translation for that same anger was this anger. The anger that is moved with smoke and rage. That they did not accept his response. I mean, I thought, I said, man, how can an ordinary man deny the table with Jesus? How can we? How can we go in day in and day out and say, nah, Jesus, I don't want to sit with you. I know you got all types of food. You offer eternal life, all these things. But let's look at what Jeremiah says, uh, how God will not only treat ordinary men, but how things will happen. See, in Lamentations, there's this interchange that, that happens like God can, in the Old Testament, God showed his anger. In the New Testament, we just get to know about it. <laughs> so in, in the beginning of uh, Lamentations 32, it says this, Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion. According to the multitude of his mercy. Even though God is angry that people are denying to come sit at his table, that ordinary men are saying no, ordinary men are being pre preoccupied, even though it is the most anger that we've ever seen, his word is confirming that he has a different response from his anger when it goes away. Yet he has caused grief. He will say, what? I will show compassion. And that's the love that we feel in the New Testament. Yet we mess up. Yet we don't show up on time. Yet we, yet we get upset when something doesn't work our way. Yet we always ask God to do things this way. He does it another way. Yet we lay out fleeces for him. But he says, yet he will show compassion. Man, I remember when I was in Bible college, that was the thing. Like, God, if you do this, this, and this, and this, then I'll jump. And I was like, man, y'all brave. I remember a young lady said, if a man walks in here with a pink shirt and white flip-flops, then I'll go to Africa. And then God will send a man in there with a pink shirt and a white flip-flops, and she's going to Africa. I would say, man, God, you are compassionate to think of us in that manner. To say, you have so much mercy that you would even allow us to even continue in that. But he says this, and then he says this at the end. I'm going to just uh, jump down to Lamentations 39. I just thought this was so crazy. He says, why should a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. We should understand when we're reaching the poor that we have the same compassion that's on them is on us. God says, why should you complain about going to the hedges and highways? Because listen, I was there for you. <laughs> Yet he will show a compassion according to his mercy. See, Jesus' theology comes through in a simple way. And I just want to share a story. How many, how many people like puppies? If you don't like puppies, then we need to talk after service. <laughs> so my wife loved this one puppy. First, we had the conversation. You know, when you first get married, you have those conversations, dogs, kids, cats, fish, what kind of animal you're going to want. If you haven't had those conversations when you're married, you will. You had those kind of conversations. I said, all right, we can get a dog. I'm thinking big, huge, St. Bernard or 
or a greyhound, something big, manly, something for me, you know. When we talk about dog, I think for me, you know. And so we're talking about a dog. And then my wife calls me and she says, we have a dog. I said, a what? A dog? She said, yeah, a dog wandering to my job. So it's so cute, Carl, and I'm bringing it home. I said, oh, okay. What kind of dog is it? I don't know. It's cute. So she sends me a picture of this dog. And all of, she's got a couple of coworkers who are like real big rescue dog friends. And, and they're like, oh, yeah, you can take it home. And a couple of days goes by, and I, she says, oh, Carl, we're going to go pick up the dog from one of, our co or one of the coworkers and stuff. So we're going to pick up this dog. The dog gets in our back seat of the car, which I think is okay because I've had puppies before, and they've traveled okay in the back seat of the car. This dog throws up. Now, y'all think that's funny. I look in the back and see what he's throwing up. This dog got worms. Oh. Yup, this dog got worms. And I said, honey, you want this dog? We can give it back right now. She said, nope. We need. So we go to the pet store, get the stuff for the dog. So that she loves this dog. I'm like, man, this is just a dog. So the next thing we know, we think we've, we've been good parents. You know, we buy them big old dog bones from the grocery store that like dried meat and everything. And we leave them in the crate. He's been good, pretty good in the crate. So we go on a date night. We come back and like this dog is like foaming at the mouth. He's throwing up. And then I, I look at Melly. I said, you still want this dog? She's like, yes, I love him. I said, oh my gosh. So we take the dog to the vet. The vet's like, oh, your dog is like Jack for life. He's got like st <laughs> stomach tearing. He'll probably never have a good, a good digestive system for the rest of it. I was like, oh my gosh. $250 later. I said, Melanie, you still love this dog? She said, yes, I still love this dog. So then we go on another date night and the dog starts throwing up again. And I'm like, what is he throwing up? And then all of a sudden I see like a little flip in the carpet. I lift up the carpet. The dog that ate the carpet foam all the carpet foam and been putting it back. It's like it's been a treat for him. <laughs> he's been putting it back. And he's, once again, he's foaming at the mouth. And I'm like, Melanie, this dog is living in the garage. He's no longer living in the house. So it's cold out, put a little heater there. And then he, we let him run around the garage while a little heater there so he stay warm. Come home one day, go in the garage. He done tore up all around the border of the garage and then and bit the cord from the heater without getting shot for some reason. So now he ain't got no heat. He, he done tore up the garage. He done did all kind of crazy stuff in there. And I asked Melanie, I said, do you still want this dog? She says, yes. Melanie is the most compassionate person I've ever met. Like the dog was gone in my mind like a long time ago. So then we, she gets pregnant with Keegan and her mom finally gets to her said, you can't have no pit bull in the house with my grandchild. And, da, da, da. and I said, oh yeah, Melanie, there's a great dog Facebook page. We can re-adopt it. We can give it away. And she's like, she's pregnant. She's, she's filled with emotions. She's like, she's mad. She's like, okay. So then she, we give the dog away and I asked her if we could share this story. She said to me after we gave the dog away, she like wanted to go check up on it. She wanted to stalk the girl's Facebook to make sure the dog is still there. I told her not to. But she said, Carl, we're never getting a dog again. Never, ever will we get a dog. You gave away my penny. Never, ever will we get a dog. And that just, show, that just shows the, like, it didn't matter to Mel what this dog did. Like, it didn't matter how objectified I was to this dog, how I didn't like this dog, how I didn't want this dog in certain areas of the house. Melanie loved it. She had such a compassion for this animal. She had such a compassion for one of God's creatures. And as I was telling her, I'm going to tell this story, she said, Carl, I didn't care how much money we were spending. I loved that dog. And see, that's how compassion fills the house. No matter what anybody does, no matter where they go, how far the length they go to, their compassion fills the house. And so as, as we talk about what that means, we're going to talk about this, this, this practice that Jesus and most of the prophets did, and it was called lamenting. And one of the things that are powerful from lamenting is, lamenting describes this, being able to understand 
and empathize with someone who you walk with. So you were filled with sorrow so you could show them compassion. Every prophet did this. Listen, I could tell if a prophet, like, did not like people. Even uh, Jonah, he said, nope, I don't like them, Lord. I'm going to run away from them. Like, prophets had this practice of what we call lamenting. They would lament for the people of God. They would cry out for the people of God. They would listen to what the Lord say. Then they would lament for the people of God. They would cry out, have compassion for them. Once they got to a point of empathizing and understanding where they're coming from as a people, they would start to do this last thing. They would lead them. And see, that was so powerful to me. And this is what it says in Amos 5, 23-24. It says, take away the melody, stop singing, stop playing music, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let me, let me understand you. Let justice roll down for those who can't play, those who can't sing, those who can't worship. See, Amos is saying the same thing. I'm lamenting for those who you don't understand. Let justice roll down like streams in their life. And then point three, compassion fills the house. See, one of the things that I've learned as a, a pastor, somebody that reaches the poor, we must show the compassion according to the multitude of God's mercy. All right, did you hear that? The multitude of God's mercy. Because if it was up to my mercy, the dog would have never made it into the house. In our car, I would have just left him on the side of the road. That's how compassionate I, I was for that animal. But because there was a different type of mercy in the room, something was able to happen. That dog was able to have a better life, a better circumstance, a better love. And sometimes when we love in people, we want to love them on our terms. We want to love them to how far they want to go. Like uh, Pastor Ben Griffin said the other day, like we give the we give the, the strong hand and the side hug and shit. You know? The side hug. We want to love people like that. We don't want no full frontal hugs walking up in here. Like you hugging me full frontal? I don't know you that well. How about that? Come on, let's get it going. And I'm like, man, that's how we treat the poor sometimes. Like I know you may be stinking of alcohol, but uh, let me get a pound, bro. You know, let's show love that quick. And I think that sometimes when we show God's mercy, it doesn't matter what somebody looks like or what somebody smells like or how much money they got or where they're coming from or how less money they got. That, that when we start to love them, we start to cry out to God for them also. And when we start to do that, we start to lead in a different capacity for that person's life. Like your own children. When you know your child's going through like the worst time, you're not waiting for somebody else to come in and pray for them. You're not waiting for somebody else to come in and share the gospel with them. You're crying out for them. You're crying out that their lives will be saved. When somebody in your family needs prayer, you're the first one on the, on the block saying, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to give my life for them. When your friends are like that, when your friends are going through things, you're the one that they come to. And you're lamenting for them. And then you're able to lead them into the next step. And see, that's what God is asking us to do. He's not asking us to just serve the poor. He's asking us to cry out for them. People that have reached the end of their rope. And see, the master in the parable tells the servant to go to places where slaves go. See, servants can go anywhere. I don't know if you ever met a servant. We would put it to a concierge or a butler. They can go anywhere, but they're not going into the byways and the hedges. They're not going to the alleys and the streets. See, a, servant, a slave can go into those places. In the darkest and the most lowly places and talk to people who they, who, who they come from. Like me, I have no problem going to the hood. I have no problem. Now, going to the Strawberry Festival, maybe. <laughs> but going to the hood, no problem. I tell people all the time when they ask me to travel outside the cities, I say, I'm good. Like, it's uncomfortable, you know? And I'm just going to say that. And so we need to see slaves go to the dark and seedy places where they came from. See, when you're a slave to the world, you know where those places are. And when you become a slave to God, you still have the power to go to those places. And then when you become a saint and a servant, you can go everywhere. 
And see, those are the things the master is telling this, this slave to go to the seedy places. See, his servant, he already went to the high courts, the people who could buy land. Now he's saying, forget those people. Go to the country. Go to the cornfields. Go to the wheat fields. Those places that are dark. A place where thieves and robbers lay in waiting. A place where you know you may get robbed if you walk down this street, but you're going to go anyway. <laughs> See, the slave servant with places where only compassion can lead. I have friends that are evangelists that do street evangelism, and some of them won't even come to Dayton's Bluff no more. They cool with being in Crystal Lake or, or so, <laughs> Cottage Grove, like, but they won't come into Dayton's Bluff. like, man, that's where I did dirt. I said, come on then. Come back. But I feel the same way when I go to Atlanta. I'm like, man, I don't want to go back there. Forget that. Forget that dark place that continually reminds me of how poor I was, of how broken I was, of how stupid I was, of how I made all these mistakes. And going back to that place is one of the hardest things I could ever do. Because at first I'm coming back and I'm facing the very epitome of my past. And I'm saying, I'm telling people, I may be facing my past, but this is what else. I'm showing you there's a way out. And that's the scariest thing for believers to do, is to go back where they were, face their past, and tell somebody else that there's hope. But that's discipleship. That's the point. And then he goes into point four, and says, this is where theology of Jesus comes in. He's asking all to compel a poor person to fill his house. See, I love how he, he, he talks to the servant and the master, but he meant us. He's talking to us. He's telling even the Jewish people in their context, hey, get ready. There are about to be some poor people in your synagogues. Get ready. Some poor people are about to come to the gospel. Get ready. Some people, you're going to preach the good news to some people that don't look like you no more. It's about to be a difference. He's asking all to compel a poor person to come fill his house. Now, he's not saying, go invite a poor person, walk them through the front door. He's saying, go out there, compel them enough, speak a word, preach a gospel that is so pure and so great that when they walk into the house, it fills them. See, it's not about just preaching the good news like I... I I, I did that before. Just walk up to somebody and preach the gospel, but never compel them into God's house. And that was my, always my dilemma. It's like I could share the gospel with somebody and they could go along, but I want to know when they're coming into God's house. When they're being discipled. When they're being cared for. When they're being loved. When somebody's shaking their hand. When somebody's hugging them. When they're seeing the beauty of the holiness of Jesus and worshiping. I want to see all those things happen when I compel somebody by the preaching of the good news. I want them to all come all the way in. Not to wait for somebody else to bring them in. And see, we have to walk beside the hopeless and lost to bring them anywhere. When's the last time you walked in with somebody that was poor and they trusted you as soon as you said something? See, that's what compelling is about, is building trust. It's not just about saying, hey, man, I got this great church, and the coffee is bomb. Let's do it. No, nope, that's not going to happen. It's not even going to say, hey, we got some great preachers that know how to preach the word. That's not even going to work. It's going to say, hey, man, I have a God that's bigger than your circumstance right now that can talk to every season that you're in in your life. If your marriage is jacked up, he's got you. If your job is jacked up, he's got you. If your kids are jacked up, he's got you. All you got to do is submit your life and come into his house and listen to his word and let it pour into every part of your heart. See, you got to compel people like that. And Jesus is talking about creating a space at the table when people think they don't deserve a seat. How many times we go, sit, we go to a restaurant and we're always worried where the waiter's going to see us? I am. I'm just being black. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> I am. I'm worried they're going to put me by the bathroom or by somewhere or give me a booth. And then if you got a kid like mine that screamed for no reason at the top of his lungs and you know you shouldn't be sitting there in Red Lobster and hear this kid and everybody just looking at him talking about he's cute. Ain't nothing cute about that. And so 
We always wonder. I even wonder when I walk into a boardroom, like, where am I going to sit? How am I going to fit into this conversation? Or when I walk into near somebody, or like walking, even when I walk into table rooms and churches, like, how do I fit? Do I just sit in the back and listen? Or do I take the place that God's called me to? Do I sit in the seat that he says that he's giving me an anointing and a, and a calling for? Do I sit in that seat? Do I stay out of that place? And wait for God to bring me there. Or wait for what I say God is bringing me there. See, we don't deserve the seat. But sometimes the table is excluding the poor. And we want to say today, we want to, we want to ask you, have you ever tried to compel somebody? I remember uh, we were having dinner church this one time, and I was talking about this. And I was talking to dinner church, is a, just for some of you that don't know, is an opportunity for a community to come around a table. And we share a gospel story. When we share that gospel story, we ask them about five questions. We ask them to discuss these questions among each other. And usually there's somebody that's a believer sitting at that table who can guide your discussion so we don't have preoccupied conversations. And so as a guy in this conversation, we had this conversation about how, when was the last time you were compelled? One person said, I ain't been compelled since I was 18 years old. When's the last time something compelled you? And then, if something compelled you, when's the last time you compelled somebody else? Inspired somebody else to move to action. Something moved you to action. And said, I'm going to do this. And, and, and uh, where's the verse at? The next verse. Come on up for the next verse. As Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think this is very important to when we're talking about reaching the poor. And we're not going to go through the whole verse. I just want to point out this verse. Verse 37, as he took Peter with him, take somebody with you, and the two sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder, John of love, and he began to be sorrowful. And deeply distressed. That was for us. Can we imagine that? That Jesus took a time and lamented over our life. He was sorrowful and he was deeply distressed. The Son of God distressed over people's lives. Deeply sorrowful. Deeply sorrowful. And I think that's important. Because as we journey together as a church, as a body of believers, we got to remember that Jesus had a compassion that moved him to sorrow first. Not just to action. Had a compassion that says, hey, I, I understand See, we sympathize with people. We can give them cards. But Jesus empathizes with people. He understands right where they're at, how they're feeling, and stays there. And walks with them in the midst of that sorrowfulness. When Jesus died on the cross, it was just a reaction from his sorrow and distress for the whole world. Carrying all the sin for us so that we can do like Lisa said, go and reach those who are just like us. And, and I want as an application, as before we even do communion, to even think, there's been, I mean, I don't even know how I'm supposed to segue this. We're doing a class that talks about this. It starts on Tuesday. But there's also this, this moment of where I've been here and preached messages and people have said, hey, how can I help? There's different ways that you can help with us. But I also want you to say, when we're doing a communion, examine yourself for a moment. And say, have I been not compassionate for my neighbor? Have I not been compassionate for my children? When will compassion fill my house? Because sometimes it really starts at home. <laughs> and the church is where the overflow happens. And when we start caring for the poor around us or in our families, 
we start to examine our hearts differently. And as we do communion today, we just want you guys to, to know that, that as, a, as a person that goes to the church, we understand how hard it is to compel somebody who is at the end of their rope. And we want to walk with you in that. I don't know who's doing communion, but I think we could, we could move to that part. And as communion is getting ready, we want you guys, I don't know if you guys know, we, we do a ministry called Love My Hood and Date is Love. We want you guys to join us. And we want, if you feel like you're compelled right now, say, hey, I want to reach the poor. We have a space for that to happen. We have a space where people are dying to hear the gospel. Literally, they need the gospel. It's life and death. Um, I don't know who's doing communion. We can do communion now. The elder. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. While Greg getting set up for communion, I want you to think about this table where people are excluded. Think about this time where people don't have access to Jesus. So as we think about reaching the poor, let's think about those who, who don't have an opportunity for the table today. Thank you for listening to this podcast from The Alley Church. More can be found at thealley.org. Follow Jesus, live love.